Good morning. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Could not ask for any more convenient Lyceum time, correct? Um, we had a lecture today by one of our new adjunct instructors. You perhaps have not seen or not know uh, Dr. Jim Foley, uh, who joined us uh, this uh, semester for the first time, and we're delighted to have him teaching with us. Uh, he has done a lot of uh, international work, a lot of work with Bible translations across the globe and uh, a variety of related issues which he will present uh, to us today or at least uh, uh, a, few, a few topics. Uh, so it fits perfectly in with our Global Perspectives curriculum. So uh, uh, delighted to have Dr. Jim Poley with him. I'll say no more. Uh, we'll go to about 11.55 to get you to your 12 o'clock classes if you have them. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Jim Poley. Thank you, Dr. Onkes. Good morning. It's uh, delightful to be here with you. In the new film, which has not been released in this country yet, called The Woman with Five Elephants, translator Svetlana Geyer says, right from the start, it is clear to Dostoevsky that the most important characteristic of a human being is his need for freedom. And that leads me to a verse from St. Paul. For freedom Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. It is this, free, uh, this theme of freedom that looms large in my mind because this year, 2011, is, as you probably are aware, the 500th anniversary of the publication of the King James Version of the Bible. Now, in bringing together a large group of scholars to translate the Bible, King James of England was up to his neck in mixed motives. He was immersed in church-state politics, not politics of state against church, but politics, if I may say, of church-state against the conditions in his realm. For as monarch, uh, James was titular head as well of the young Church of England. His first concern was for the unity of his realm. It was threatened. Among other factors, there was the factor of religious differences. There were die-hard Catholics. There were the enthusiastic Anglicans of the new Church of England. There were the Puritans. James I had been James VI of Scotland, a hotbed of Puritanism and Presbyterianism, from which James was recruited to become James I of England. His first concern was the unity of his realm. His second concern, of course, was the continual legitimization of his rule, the so-called divine right of kings. He had subjects, a demoralizing many subjects, who were ready to dispute the notion of a divine right to rule. This is a very good example of the inherently political nature that Bible translation can have, which we want to discuss today. Bible translation, of course, has its enormous um, scholarly, academic aspect to it, but it also has a social and political aspect. Um, <coughs> Even when the political aspect of Bible translation is not much in evidence, it is always there potentially. Which is unsurprising because any human activity, come to think of it, can be politicized. And here I use the term politics in a special way. I use it, or in a limited way, I just want to restrict it to efforts of the state or of the government at any level that may be relevant to constrain or control the process of Bible translation. And by the process of Bible translation, I mean not only the technical process of 
turning on paper uh, scripture from one language into another, but I also mean the ancillary uh, tasks that are normally present in Bible translation, particularly in minority languages in the world, which we'll discuss more in a, in a minute. Tasks like uh, literacy, even community development tasks like health education, uh, even putting into place some kind of education system sometimes, or ramping up or improving the education system that's there. Uh, all of these tasks might belong, and frequently do, depending upon the local situation, to the task of Bible translation. So my own background is that is one of uh, having worked for many years, mostly in West Africa, among minority languages. A little bit in northern Quebec. The minority language Bible translation scene in the world today is far different from the Bible translation scene that we are most familiar with, which is that of majority languages, particularly English. You can go down to your bookstore and be presented with a bewilderingly wide choice of English translations, of English versions of the Bible. Typically in minority language context, this is not the case. One has only one choice, if one choice. Minority language Bible translations, the process is not, in the, in the free world at least, constrained overtly by state politics, but in the old Iron Curtain countries of Europe, for example, it certainly was. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have said majority language Bible translation is not normally constrained in the, in the free world. But with minority language projects, on the other hand, the politics of Bible translation tend to be in evidence, and sometimes in quite a stark form, particularly in connection with matters of local language development and local literacy. In order to give you a taste of the kind of minority language situation with which I am most familiar in West Africa, let's try to do for a minute a thought experiment. Imagine that we are all native speakers and native residents of a place in North Carolina I'll call Wingate. We all live in Wingate and we all speak Wingate. And let's imagine further that Wingate has only about 20,000 speakers. Let's imagine further that Wingate is unwritten as a language. Let's imagine further that there is a larger language in a place down the road we call Monroe. Monroe, let's say, has 40,000 speakers. And they tend to throw, to throw their weight around because they run the county. Um, but the largest regional language, the most prominent, influential regional language is the language of Charlotte. They have over a million speakers. Uh, there is act Charlotte is actually a written language. There is a few newspapers in Charlotte. And a lot of churches in the Charlotte area use Charlotte as the language of worship. And whenever we get any preachers here, they tend to preach us, to us in Charlotte. And we don't do such a good job understanding Charlotte. Education, we do have schools, but you have to study in Raleigh. That is in the language of Raleigh. Raleigh controls, Raleigh is spoken by the whole eastern half of the state, and they run everything. Uh, if you go to school, you must study in Raleigh. You must study in the language of Raleigh. Uh, we don't speak it here normally, and it's not much in use. As a result, only uh, one in ten of our school children becomes fluent in Raleigh. And they are the ones marked with the potential for advancing in education. The rest drop out. After six years, 
there's no school for the rest. Now, you can let your mind grapple with some of the possible ramifications of a language situation like this. The, uh, this kind of language situation happens all over West Africa. Nigeria has, at last count, 407 languages, and they are all combined with each other in a bewilderingly chaotic pattern. So you have uh, the largest languages of a place like Nigeria, Yoruba, Igbo, for example. Then you have regionally important languages. Then you have minority languages. 10,000 speakers, 5,000 speakers. And in all of this a bewilderment, the church must make its way, the education system must make its way, the political system must make its way. It is clear that children who do not grow up speaking a majority language in such a context uh, are liable to lose out big in the education. And it is against the backdrop of this kind of sociolinguistic situation that I want to offer three theses this morning. One is that the Bible translation process always tends to liberate those to whom it comes. And in so doing, the Bible translation process tends, therefore, to subvert the status quo of the society. And finally, in response to this subverting tendency, the existing powers often try to control or to influence, to constrain the Bible translation process in some way. The control of the Bible translation process is not necessarily always negative. If the regime believes in what Bible translators happen to be doing at the moment, they may promote. They may use their not inconsiderable influence to help. But uh, it's an influence that perhaps we might say can turn against one just as easily after it appears to be for you. All right. Bible translation in the minority world, I'm a little excursus here, 6,800 plus languages spoken in the world today. 1,200 languages, the number of language communities which have access to the New Testament in their heart language. 457, the number of language communities that have the entire Bible. 457 out of 6,800 plus. 2,000 plus languages, the number of languages without any of the Bible, but with a possible need for a Bible translation to begin. Scratch out possible and read probable. Well, what about the difference between 2,000 plus and 6,800 plus? Well, simply, we don't know. Much more survey, much more assessment has to be done. 340 million or so people, the number of people represented by those 2,000 languages. The Bible translation process, as I said, always tends to liberate its audience. It liberates minority languages, minority language speakers from a feeling of inferiority by bringing God's word into the language time after time after time. We hear uh, comments from local language speakers upon receiving a portion of God's word in the mother tongue finally God speaks my language T 
tends to liberate. by bringing God's word into the language. God speaks my language now, so we are somebody. Bringing reading and writing into existence in the local language. By codifying the language, which is exactly what happens when literacy comes into a language, Profound shifts in attitude uh, are effected. Often when I worked among the Mbe people of southeastern Nigeria, as we devised a writing system, as we tried out different ways of marking tone, as people were learning the system, it dawned on me that we were doing much more than simply the sum of our discrete tasks. In codifying the language, we were assisting in the, shall I say, the crystallization of something new, hard to define, but almost palpable. People were talking about their language with a growing awareness. One man told me that it kept him awake at night, wondering how it could be that the same syllables could differ in meaning because of a different tone that they would have. The difference between, for example, meze to smell and meze to bite. He professed himself worried by that. Well, it's nothing to worry about, I told him. But you may still uh, well stay awake at night wondering about it. There was also an innate idea among people that if you wrote anything down, it had jolly well better be true. And correct, that is to say, well formed. Oral societies, purely oral societies, where there is no writing, still have an idea of what we linguists call well formedness. Uh, 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 an oral communication may be well formed or it may not be. A wonderful example of this is, is not just anyone in an African village will consent to tell you a folk story, even though they all know them. They will say, well, go to Abdu Abang over here. He's a wonderful teller of stories. I won't do it. But he knows the story, but he won't do it. There is this concern, even on an oral level, for well formedness. But if it's written down, it had better be true. No lies allowed on paper, please. How do you account for this attitude? I often ask myself. Well, it's this novelty, I think it has something to do with the novelty of writing, of putting, of capturing on paper what was previously uncapturable. The notion that, in a, in a holy oral language, that the human faculty of language is a prisoner of time. Once spoken, the word is like an arrow. It cannot be drawn back. For the first time, you capture it. Not only that, you involve a different sense. Speaking involves only uh, the sense of hearing. But to capture something on paper involves, crucially, the sense of sight. So there's a whole new uh, sense now available for perceiving one's language. It's revolutionary. It is revolutionary. And then, just as the human instinct is always to take something and to improve it, or from an aesthetic standpoint to make it more attractive, make it beautiful, so you take an image of your language on the paper in vowels and consonants. And then you see how you can get to, well, let's improve this aesthetically. 
And so the whole notion of calligraphy comes up. Beautiful writing. So it's a world of new sense, sensation, and shall I say aesthetics that people are introduced to. And you don't have to teach them. There is something inside them that instinctively thinks of these things and runs after them. And it's mar it was marvelous to me. I didn't understand it. I, understand, I understood almost nothing of what I was witnessing, but I knew I was seeing something important. And then there's the feeling that one's mother tongue, previously unwritten, is now raised to the level of a European language, of English or French. There's that feeling. It's an, it's an enormously affirming feeling. So here we have a dictionary. The idea of being able to catalog words, or what we linguists call lexical items. The idea of being a, no one had ever done that before. There had been no way. Other things that we take for granted but hardly associate with the task of literacy became possible. I was working not all that long ago with uh, a translation team in northern Cameroon. And we were looking at some of the genealogies in scripture. And I took a piece of paper and I started writing down my family tree. There's me. Here's my brothers and sisters. Here's my parents. Here's my grandparents. They said, what's that? I said, it's a family tree. C'est un arbre généalogique in French. It's a family tree. They said, what's that? I said, well, it's a way that you can write down your, yourself, your siblings, your, your parents, their parents, uh, your cousins, how, how everybody is related. They got the point at once. They had never seen it before. They had never thought of it before. The next day, they came back. And they were all armed with these enormous sheets of brown wrapping paper. And they were covered with these schematics of their own family trees, which was quite a feat because they come from polygamous families. <laughs> so not, let that pass. Anyway, it was something entirely new and entirely uh, uh, in, entirely engrossing for them. So all kinds of things like that that we don't normally think of with the, alf with the literacy process that actually are involved. South American Indians were infamously told by their Spanish conquerors, the conquistadores, that their own languages, the Indian languages, were not fit for reasoning in, were not fit vehicles for the faculty of reasoning. And so they themselves were obviously, to the, to the Spanish mind, not able to reason. What that simple attitude communicated to the Indians probably affected in their psychology was perhaps more profound than all the physical oppression and all the other abuse that they suffered at the Spanish hands. Bible translation also liberates from ignorance of God's word. That would seem like a no-brainer of a statement, but the effects can be huge. Among the Hide people of northern Cameroon, who had no Bible, 
but they had a big concrete church in the mountains, right there on the Nigerian Cameroon border, way up in the mountains. But no local language Bible. There was an itinerant preacher from Nigeria who was welcomed one day, one Sunday among them, and he began to preach in their church service. And he said he would bring them a text from the Old Testament. And the text concerned the story of a prophet who found a brass lamp and rubbed it, and out came an angel. And this angel had a message for him. This is the word of the Lord. And there was not one person among the congregation capable of saying, wait a minute, where did you find that? Not one. There is a liberation from ignorance of, of God's word that goes on when people receive the Bible in their mother tongue. And also crucially, when God's word is received in the mother tongue, Western biases in presenting God's word or interpreting God's word tend to be uh, diminished or canceled entirely. The Yale academic uh, Laman, Laman uh, Sena talks extensively about this in his volume called Translating the Message. In Africa, it is very common to hear the attitude that Christianity is a good religion for believing, but a poor religion for living. Because it cannot handle the evil spirits. And Senna would say, he does say in his book, that in fact, the reluctance to go to war with evil spirits is, stems from a Western bias. We are here to preach the gospel. We are not here to, to worry about evil spirits. That's the Western bias. The Western, shall we say, rationalistic bias. They probably don't exist anyway, the evil spirits. So Bible translation tends to liberate from Western bias. Now, in so doing, however, the Bible translation process also tends to subvert society's status quo. One of the supreme examples of this, to my mind, was still the change in uh, British sensibilities regarding political freedom in the aftermath of the King James Version. By six, the King James came out in 1611. By 1644, the Scottish Presbyterian divine Samuel Rutherford could write his book entitled Lex Rex, The Law is King which attacked the doctrine of the divine right of absolute monarchs and instead argued for constitutional and limited government. This work was publicly burned in Oxford after Rutherford's death. Argument one. This is Rutherford writing. The power which is obliged to command and rule justly and religiously for the good of the subjects and is only set over the people on these conditions and not absolutely cannot tie the people to subjection without resistance when the power is abused to the destruction of laws, religion, and the subjects. But all power of the law is thus obliged and hath and may be abused by kings to the destruction of laws, religion, and subjects. The proposition is clear. That's playing with fire if you have a monarch who believes he's sitting on the throne because of God's will. By 1776, during the American Revolution, George III correctly saw that the, the core, the center of the revolution was in the New England states. Not by accident, the home of the Puritans. Status quo. Subverting the status quo. By 1849, the state of Virginia had gotten around to outlawing literacy, the teaching of reading and writing to slaves. South Carolina had passed a similar law earlier than that in 1830, and about half the southern uh, uh, states ended up doing so. 
go to the northern half of Cameroon, where Islam, the institutions of Islam, rule the northern half of Cameroon. But I believe the northern half of Cameroon is on the, its way to becoming Christian because of all the languages there that have received God's word in their mother tongues. The subversion is felt, believe me it is felt, by local Muslim rulers. The sultans who find themselves in charge of increasing numbers of Cameroonian Christians. We had resistance for our own literacy program among the Mofugudur people by the local sultan. He did not want his people to learn to read and write. James himself wanted the King James Version. He wanted it badly. So he set, them, he set, it, he set the process in place. Because England at the time was using the Geneva Bible more than anything else. It's so using the Geneva Bible, which had appeared 51 years before 1611, and had been done, it had been translated in Geneva, Switzerland, by a group of Puritan divines. The Geneva Bible was loaded with footnotes, marginal notes. James was really opposed to some of these notes. Psalm 105.15 says, Touch not my anointed one. Speaking of the king. Geneva footnote was, Those whom I have sanctified to be my people. Touch not my anointed. In the text. Footnote. This means those I have sanctified to be my people. Oh, James hated it. It was far too perniciously a democratizing, democratizing tendency that he saw in the Geneva Bible. So, one of the policies that the King James translators made for their new version was no footnotes. We'll get rid of this. No footnotes. Except, they did allow notes for a technical explanation of various Greek or Hebrew words. But that was it. No footnotes. But there was an unintended consequence to the policy of no footnotes. A consequence that we live with today. And that is that some kind of myth started to grow up that all you need to, un to understand a translated text is the text itself in translation. Just the bare words, the plain text, the unadorned text. That's all you need to understand something in translation. The Geneva Bible translators had known better. They had known better. But we still live with that attitude today. You need no what we linguists call paratext. You need no notes. You need no explanations for anything. All you need is the bare text in translation. It's a myth and an illusion. There are other kinds of aspects to the Bible translation process that get constrained and controlled by local governments or by governments at any, at any, at any level. Um, in southeastern Nigeria, the, the uh, most prominent written language, the most prominent regional language is Efik, spoken at the, at, in and around the port of Calabar. And where we were, about 200 miles north, among the Embe people, we would write like this. Mm. OK, 
Kanene Trapbon Yukema Lui Tochio, a bird that sings a lot cannot build a nest. Nice proverb. But ethic doesn't use these symbols. It would prefer this. You can see the difference. Also, no tone marks. Ethic doesn't like tone marks. So you get regional pressures to conform in the writing system to what is, to what is the most influential language in the area. And in vain might the linguist remonstrate, but these are two different languages. So the pressure is still there. And then, of course, we come to a no-brainer of, 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 of ways in which governments try to constrain and control Bible translation. For example, the governments where either in regions or at the national government level, there is our religious is, uh, hostilities or a uh, ideological hostility to Christianity. Uh, communist regimes, typically, uh, are against Bible translation. In Indonesia, it is permissible to translate the Bible for animistic groups in Papua, but not in places like Sumatra or Sulawesi or Java, because in those regions, it is, uh, the Bible translation process is seen as proselytizing people away from Islam. Moreover, with 700 languages spoken anyway, the nation of Indonesia refuses to promote local languages. People learn regional languages, but the national government prefers them all to become literate in Indonesian. In China, communist ideology being against all religion, the ethnic minorities such as the Montagnards are persecuted, sometimes mer mercilessly, particularly uh, uh, since they tend to be heavily Christian themselves. In India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, there is much Hindu and Buddhist opposition to Bible translation. In Nepal, there is communist ideology present in the government, even though there is no official com communist ideology in the nation. Hinduism, more than anything else, functions as a, as a national religion there. In all of these areas, you get uh, sometimes very major opposition to Bible translation projects at all. The tag end of this presentation I had entitled, How Much Freedom Can You Stand? This needs some explanation. Benjamin Franklin was reportedly asked by a woman at the end of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, well, doctor, what have you given us? A republic or a monarchy? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. However we wish to define freedom, the human condition seems to me to be such that the amount of personal freedom that we can exercise must finally be limited by the size and number of accruing responsibilities that we can shoulder. I'll say it again. The amount of personal freedom that we can exercise must finally be limited by the size and number of accruing responsibilities that we must shoulder. The responsibilities, I mean, that come with the freedom. It's uh, commonplace to think of uh, winners of really big lottery tickets, the ones who w win millions and millions of dollars, who uh, experience a ruined nation of their own lives as a result. Financial freedom to an extent that apparently is not balanced by, the, by the, their ability to exercise responsibility with it.
To ethnic groups who have known nothing of it, God's word tends to open up vast vistas of self-respect, both personal and societal, and an assurance that the group has a God-ordained place in his world. This ethnic group that thought so little of itself now has a God-ordained place in his world, and that the individual has a God-ordained place in God's kingdom. And just as crucially, that these kinds of assurances become projected by this ethnic group that now has God's word onto other ethnic groups. The thought here being, if God has done it for us, he can do it for you. God's word is indeed marvelous, even when it is translated wrongly, or let us say for mixed motives it still tends to have liberating effects. Such is the nature of God's word. This brings us full circle then to what I hope today is our little celebration of 500 years of the King James Version. The king meant it for his realm's stability. He meant it for the legitimization of his own rule. And let's be fair, perhaps he had another motive mixed in. He wanted the Church of England to be well. But in the end, it fomented restless rebellion. It foments freedom. And that's why I conclude that it is a God-pleasing thing, but at the same time, a dangerous thing to give people his word. Thank you very much.